With that, let me introduce Bruce Gunther and Lee Kelly. Maybe I can pull this thing back. Okay. There. There was something about the spatial tension between the podium and the speaker that <laughs> caused Lee, the sculptor, to rearrange space and demonstrate that creativity knows no bounds. Um, thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you all for coming, for being part of this cultural and creative history and heritage that Pacific Northwest College of Art represents, that the history and the creativity that has sprung from the 100 years of its history um, has given our city, our state, and our region and now more than ever are internationally reaching across to satellite programs that have developed. It's my pleasure and uh, daunting honor to be a, an inquisitor with Lee Kelly, who has 50 years of practice of dodging the expected and the predictable, who has taken the contrarian's path from walking out months before he graduated from this venerable institution and needed to be talked back into walking the walk during graduation to his aesthetic and um, intellectual choices of pursuing a path that has led and mirrored the aesthetic and intellectual issues of our age, of the decades that have formed his practice. And I, had, I thought that we would start with some part of his biography because artists inevitably shuffle their cards. Um, and their cards come from their roots, their experience, and the incidents and accidents that shape their lives. And from, <laughs> Lee has had all of those, it turns out careening off scaffolding, hooking himself on sculptures, tumbling down hills and mountains, and living a life engaged in the practice of making things that touch and move us, that challenge us, and that engage us in the, in the widest range of human emotions. I'd like to start by talking about how um, you moved from your early successes as a painter, and your now famous quote about being a painter because that's where the action was, where the ideas were happening when you were in school, into sculpture um, and the process that you stepped into. Okay, you want me to talk now? Yes. Okay, first. <laughs> that's first, called a handoff. First, first I want to say, Bruce is an artist who just happens to have a day job. <laughs> The, uh, okay, back to your question. Um, it was George Johansson that really questioned why I put paint on sculptures at some point. And um, George, I see you there. <laughs> Do you remember this? No, because paint was, I don't know if you assume paint should stay on the wall or not, but there was this issue of trying to put that kind of painterly energy into three-dimensional things. And um, finally, I just quit painting. Well, you know, I, I, I think that makes a great deal of, that challenging question from one of our preeminent painters to ask you, why are you struggling against this? Why are you moving this sacred medium to another is an interesting one. But it makes sense if, um, when you look at the paintings, your paintings of the 50s and early 60s, when this kind of attack that was physical, almost sculptural in its intent, had to find a way to translate. What prompted you to pick up sheet metal and start soldering, which became ultimately welding and then it became something else? Mm -hmm. How did, what, 
what suggested itself to you? Was it the curriculum at the school that said, you will be an artist, you will study the classic forms? Was no, it I don't Fred think Litton? so. I, I think it was a matter of serendipity of uh, buying a soldering iron. <laughs> and, it led to, and it led to a whole bunch of more complicated machines. Um, and I don't mean to flip off that question. I just think that period when you're in school is this wonderful time when you sort out all sorts of possibilities. And um, the museum school really afforded me that. I had contact with just absolutely wonderful people. And the idea of investigating things, whether they mounted anything or not, was just fine. And I don't know if I answered that, but. Well, no, but I, I think you've touched on two important ideas there. The, the, the process that an artist, if they are to, to find their own voice and to find a meaningful voice for culture, has have to be open. They can't be inside an envelope and stay there. And then the culture of the school, um, which was shaped by artists, which followed a curriculum that artists developed that talked about core ideas and an open window to experiment and to go. Uh -huh. I mean, because you had Fred Lippmann, who was classic sculptor, yeah. a and, caster, and a model. my dichotomy was between Louis Bunch and Fred Lippmann, <laughs> and that was a lot of way, there was a lot of room there to step across. There was, yeah, um, but both of them affected me immeasurably. Oh. And well, you know, I, I can see Louis Bunce in, in the painting and feel his spirit in the embracing of the accidental, the incidental, yeah. the, 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 the joy in the pain. With Fred Littman, who I think of in, in what's left of his oeuvre in our city, which is classical um, yeah. and uh, figuratively based, I only begin to, to hear a voice or see an echo in the surfaces of his bronzes uh -huh. with a Fred, kind of scratching and sculptural. The wonderful thing about Fred that he had no resentment toward people who did things, and he would say the modern way. <laughs> and um, so he kind of encouraged this whole thing, that although experiment. he himself, I think Fred thought he was trapped in his 19th century skin. Yeah. And it was very hard for him to, he, he made attempts to move beyond. But uh, I, I think I got a lot from Fred. Well, yeah. you know, I think uh, if you look at the sculptors that his, his teaching spawned in this community, it's a, it, it's a rich and varied body yeah. of people. And they all, in turn, have inspired other people to experiment. It's nice to think of those two personalities, because Louis Bunce, who was ready to move with the wind. Right, who, and who, did quite often. Yes. Right. And, and, you know, from stylistically fluid, carrying mm -hmm. with him his joy of color, but always willing to try another another style, another He could become anyone girlfriend. at any one moment. Yeah. Right? And Fred Lippmann, who felt himself in this thing, right. but willing to, to let the, the tree grow where it sprouted. When Fred talked about form, he talked about being in my old studio, and my old would go over and pick up the skirt of his friend and say, that's real form. <laughs> and there was nothing like a concave surface. Everything yeah. was moving out. So is which, this which going sort of, off? Well, you know, which... Are we going sideways with this, Bruce? No, no, <laughs> we're about to get back to your early sculpture where form tends to explode into space and it, and it blooms. Yeah. And one of the things that happens in those early soldered pieces, because it's very thin metal, in order to get a form that will stand up, you have to have convex and concave surfaces yeah. that reinforce each other and they begin to be plant-like or yeah. f organic in their yeah. real sense yeah. in order to be structurally f and sound. Th there is that moment when George Johansson comments on moving the paint onto the, the sculpture. I and may have misquoted George on that too. Well, <laughs> I, it's a plausible conversation. Yeah, um, but I should have had it with George before we did it here. But. You know, 
history is a series of plausible ideas invented by the writer. Yeah. And so um, this conversation is going to follow that form. All right. 